Welcome to Aston Means Business. I'm Steve Dyson, the journalist presenting this podcast for Aston Business School. We're focusing on how small businesses, SMEs, are coping with the huge economic disruption caused by the coronavirus pandemic. This special series is called Aston Means Business, SMEs Dealing with COVID-19. We're talking to businesses who have taken part or who've previously taken part in Aston Centre for Growth's programmes. We're giving them a voice to discuss their challenges, share their experiences and explain how they are coping with the crisis. We're also interviewing some of Aston Business School's top academics and other experts, getting their valuable insight, analysis and advice for SMEs. In today's episode, we're going to find out how Caviar and Chips, a specialist wedding reception and hospitality company, is keeping close to its customers, partners, venues and suppliers to make sure it emerges from the lockdown in good health. We'll also be talking to Dr Julius Stefan. He's an expert in consumer behaviour at Aston Business School. Please bear with us as all recordings are carried out remotely online to make sure we conform to the government's current stay-at-home advice. Okay, so joining me online now is Mark Hornby. Mark's the co-founder of Caviar and Chips. Hello to you, Mark. Hello, Steve. Good to be here. Looking forward to talking to you. Yeah, me, you too, especially because you've got such a fascinating name of your company, Caviar and <laughs> Chips. I, I, can, I can almost visualise what it's all about. But I want you to tell us um, and to tell our listeners what the company is, when you formed, etc. And, and, and what you do, what makes Caviar and Chips the company that it is? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a nice name and uh, we do get lots of comments about it. Um, and so we set ourselves up in 2017. Um, interestingly, we had, our, we had our third birthday just a few weeks ago, uh, which we celebrated during lockdown. Um, so we, uh, we set ourselves up in 2017 as a catering company. And uh, it was myself and my co-founder, Jonathan. And we were at business school, at Aston Business School, doing our MBA. And we were we were always interested in setting our own business up. We weren't quite sure what it would be. Um, Jonathan had been a chef for about 100 years. I'd always worked in kind of like sales and marketing. We'd always had an interest in food and hospitality. And so we were kind of like wrestling with some ideas around that. And obviously studying at business school, we were being taught about the principles of how you set up a business uh, concepts about entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur and whether or not it was right for us. And I guess we were just looking for what our, what our product might be. And Jonathan was planning his wedding at the time. And so between lectures, we'd be talking about his wedding. And he was quite particular being a chef in, in background that he wanted a particular menu, five courses, matching wines. It was, it was quite insane what he wanted for his menu. But by the way, he was going out to these different caterers and saying the kind of things that he'd like, and he just couldn't find a caterer that would be able to do the wedding that he wanted. So as we were talking about it, we went, ah, actually, you're a customer. You've got a problem. And I wonder if we could create a business around that. So we almost used him as a, as a case study. So he did his own wedding. He got himself some chefs, uh, did their own bar, and it was, a, it was an incredible wedding. And I guess that was the catalyst for us setting up Caviar and Chips. And the basis of it was that we would go out to clients and we would do any kind of menu they wanted. So we're completely bespoke and we start all of our menus from a blank piece of paper. Um, So primarily we do weddings and we also do corporates. We've got this growing portfolio of uh, corporate clients as well. And we also do private parties at anniversaries and and birthdays and things like that. In our first year, we were both working full time. So we probably did maybe about six or seven different events and we're kind of like testing concept. Uh, second year, we probably did about 20 events. And then that's when Jonathan went full time in caviar and chips. And then third year, which is the year we've just done, uh, we've just completed just over 60 events. Uh, this wow. year, we were hoping to get to over 100. Uh, and then the world turned upside down. Um, but, and also in the last couple of weeks, we've added to the business where we've opened a pub. Um, so we own a pub in Warwickshire, a little town in Kenilworth, a, a nice pub called, um, the Virgins and Castle, which is a 16th century wonky inn um lovely old traditional pub so we opened that on friday the 13th of march um we, we jokingly said that friday the 13th was a bit superstitious but we thought we would both be fine and then the following week we had to close um so that was a shame uh but so that runs in the background and then we're also working on our own boutique destination venue as well so that would be like a seven uh, seven bedroom stately home which would be a kind of like a destination venue for all weddings and events 
So we're currently going through planning permission for that at the moment. So um, broadly, a hospitality group with different aspects to the business, but fundamentally around catering, customer experience, food and drink. Wow, quite a story, quite a story. And, and, and just, just briefly, just so we get a full picture, uh, what, what, what kind of staff numbers do you have and have you got any turnover figures that you can tell us about? Yeah, sure. So um, as I said, you know, it was Jonathan and I that set it up and it was just him, him and I as we were, we were starting to grow the business. And then we slowly added to it with um, kind of like contract staff. We'd have chefs with us working with us for maybe three to six month contracts as we were growing pipeline. Last year, uh, around about October, we added to our leadership team. So we recruited two full-time head chefs and we recruited the chief operations officer. So we now have a leadership team of five people, so five FTE. And that really transformed our business, um, made us a lot more slick. We really focused on our processes and systems and we were able to scale. And then we've probably got um, between 40 and 50 people who would be regarded as our hosts. Um, so they work for us, they're trained by us, uh, and then they run the events for us during the year. Um, so they'll be um, looking after brides and grooms or corporate events. Um, and then in our pub, we've probably got um, an FT of around about 10 to 12 people um, from manager that runs it, deputy, chefs in the kitchen, and then again, host and barter. Turnover of the catering side is probably about a quarter of a million. And then bolting on the pub, that probably takes us to about a million total. So quite quite a complex and growing business, which sounds great. But of course, like all of us, you've come to 23rd of March, the lockdown. Um, there's been a three-week extension, so that's going to be at least six weeks now. How, how has that pandemic affected caviar and chips and your various businesses? Yeah, so, I, well, I guess the simplest one, if you start with the pub, that we had to close our doors. So we, we took on this pub um, and we, were, we planned an opening, which was on Friday the 13th of March. And then the week after we had to close. So we had an amazing opening weekend and lots of engagement from the community, which was really fun and exciting. But then sadly and quickly we had to close. So um, that that's completely changed what our plans were there. We've been lucky working with, uh, we work with a brewery called Everard's, who are based over in Leicestershire. Um, they've got about 170 pubs around the country, mainly around the Midlands. And so they've been supporting us and we've been working with them about how we keep the team. Because fundamentally, we want to look after our team. We obviously want to look after our customers too. Um, and we just want to be ready for when we can open that again. Um, with the caviar and chips catering side of things, we've been working closely with a lot of our clients who have had to sadly postpone their events. Um, so our wedding season probably would have started in February. So we were already running and, and doing weddings. Um, but then we probably had to move 20, 20, 25 different weddings um, that were planned between March through to up to end of May. Today, I was just talking to a couple actually who've got their wedding planned at the end of the May. And they're kind of, we're not sure what we should do. Should we cancel? Should we move it to a different date? And what we've been doing is we've been putting in alternative dates for all of our clients so that they can move it. And we've just been trying to be as supportive and understanding as possible and keep things really flexible. Obviously, terms and conditions tend to go out the window. And we just want to make sure that we look after our clients first. And then we've had to work really close in the venues because planning a wedding or an event is quite complex in terms of the number of suppliers that are involved to making sure that all of those events are, are joined up. Yeah, and, and whilst all that's going on, what have you had to do, just briefly, in terms with your staff, is there any furloughing going on? Have you had to take up any government assistance? How have you coped on that side? Before we talk about how you're getting through, um, just, just what, 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 what sort of direct impact has it had on your, um, on your staff and, and, and any else, anything else that you need from the government? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, we have furloughed um, both teams within pub and within the catering side of things. Um, so just myself and Jonathan are, are still working full time. Um, so I guess you know, in terms of delivery, there's nothing to deliver. Um, but what we have been doing is, as, as I say, is looking after all of our clients. We've so we've taken advantage of government support in that respect, and we're getting support up to eighty percent of salary. So, but for the last month, we've been paying a hundred percent, and I guess we'll keep on reviewing that. For some of the government support, we're not eligible. Um, and we're, we're finding our way through some of the loops and how, what things are we eligible for and how can we access them. And we're working with our accountants closely and obviously our, our local councils and the Chamber of Commerce as well to see what kind of things we can take advantage of that will support the business. And then we've been looking at financing op- op- opportunities with, um, with our bank as well, see how they can help us with cash flow. 
I understand. Yeah, and as, as it sounds like you're getting through that in quite a in quite a reasonably calm way. Um, although it's, it, it must sometimes feel like a bit of a panic to, to to face all those things. But you're talking about your clients all the time. I've noticed so. Is that the way that you're focused on the future? You're making sure that the existing clients you have and the prospective clients are are looked after in terms of future options and so that you're all ready to get up and going once it's all over? Yeah, that's right. So one of the things that Jonathan and I did when we first set ourselves up was we wanted to be, we wanted to have a purpose and we wanted to be values led. Um, that, that was really important to us. So yes, we want to make profit and we want to be successful and we want to grow we're really aspirational and ambitious in how we want to grow our business. But what we all both said, and I think where our moral compasses are aligned is that it had to be values driven. So our purpose is all about creating moments and memories for our clients. And we are client led. I talked about Jonathan's situation where he just couldn't find anyone that could help him. And so the premise of all of our businesses is that we put our clients first. Um, our second value is that we're collaborative, so we always work together. We always think of ourselves as better together, whether that's as a team or with our suppliers or with our customers. Um, we're super positive and then we're really creative. So all of our decisions have been based on our values and, as I say, being fundamentally client-led. And I think if we've, we've been taking our view that look long-term and if you look after our clients, then we'll be fine. Um, we believe that we have a great product, we have a great service, and I think if you look after your clients, then they'll look after you in the long term. And we've also been thinking about our network and how we work with venues, how we work with wedding planners, how we work with our corporate partners as well, just to make sure that we're working together because we can, and it goes back to that second value of being better together, don't think you should try and fix problems by yourself, especially times like this. It is about collaboration, working together, pulling together that kind of gets you through the harder times. Absolutely. And yeah. that sounds like a really good approach, Mark. And obviously, none of us have the exact answers to how things are going to emerge. Um, but it sounds like at least six weeks in total, if not a bit longer for the lockdown before any restrictions are lifted. But, but the detail aside, because we can't predict that as and when things emerge, because things will return to some kind of near normality at some point. Um, whether that's June or July, whenever it is, do, do you feel confident that the business is ready to emerge or is, has this changed things forever for you? No, so I mean, we are we are really looking forward to uh, things as a, uh, in, in quote marks getting back to normal. Um, we interestingly, you know, we're still getting a lot of inquiries coming through for events, weddings, bookings for next year and the year after. So we're kind of running through two things in parallel. It's like looking after today, making sure we keep an eye on cash flow. Great thing about Jonathan is that he really is a, a finance numbers detail kind of guy. And so I can just relax and know that he's got that covered. And I guess the great thing about having co-founders is you've got two people with two very different skills. Um, I really enjoy looking to the future and looking after our clients and thinking about relationships. And so I think that us working together in that respect really works. Um, we have been communicating with our team on a regular basis. We have almost like an internal comms uh, plan in place. And we've been working with a consultancy called Next Steps around well-being. So we've got a well-being strategy in place. Um, and so we're thinking about how do we communicate with our team, keeping things relevant, keeping people informed. Um, we've done things like with our pub, we've done a virtual pub quiz. So we're keeping our customers engaged, um, keeping things interested. And Steve, if you fancy doing a pub quiz, you can always go onto the Virgin and Castle Facebook on a Tuesday night and join in. Um, Sounds great. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that's a great way to just keep our customers engaged and keeping touch points. With the catering side of things, we've been writing about menus. We've been talking about event ideas. We've been looking to the future about what does a wedding or a corporate event look like at Christmas or autumn or trends that could be getting set for next year. And I think just thinking about those touch points that we can constantly be communicating with folk and being supportive and trying to add value and trying to be relevant all of the time will help us be ready for when the world does go back to normal and we can go out again. Um, hopefully people would have seen us working well with our team, supporting our team and as leading them through it so that when they do come back to work, it kind of feels like they're just going back to the, what, what they've been used to anyway. And again, with our clients and our customers and any of the partners that we have, because we've been communicating and keeping in touch, um, again, it will, should hopefully feel seamless. We've got plans in place for when we are ready again. Um, so hopefully again, when, when we do go back to normal, then we're, we're already in set to do so. 
Mark, it sounds as if uh, you and your team and Jonathan are, are really going about things in a good way. It's thrilling to hear uh, about a company's actions, um, someone who's uh, still keeping all that positivity and energy going. So well done on that. And, and many thanks for joining us, Mark. Oh, no, thanks very much for, for having me. It was really nice to chat to you. That was Mark Hornby, the co-founder of Caviar and Ships. Um, and we, all of us here at uh, Aston Means Business, wish him and the company uh, the very best at this time. Joining me online now is Dr. Julius Stefan. Uh, Julius is a lecturer in marketing at Aston Business School, and his research focuses on the consumer. Uh, hello to you, Julius. Hi, Stephen. Good to talk to you today. And to you. Now, Julius, uh, you heard the interview with Mark Hornby of Caviar and Chips, um, the way they've built up a huge hospitality business in such a short time. And, and the genesis there sounded really simple. One of the founders simply looked at himself as a potential customer who had a problem finding the perfect wedding and provided the answer by saying, we'll do any kind of menu you want, completely bespoke. That was entirely consumer focused, wasn't it? Yes, um, that's completely right. I think that uh, SME is really a great example of a customer-led firm. So they really focus upon the needs of customers and uh, trying to solve their problems collaboratively. I think that's uh, one thing um, that Mark really stressed. So in academia, we refer usually to that as co-creation of value. And that goes really to the heart of modern consumer marketing and branding. And I also think that there's um, even a broader facet to being consumer focused, and that relates to their core brand story. So consumers, they usually trust and engage with brands that tell an authentic and compelling story. And uh, a wedding is potentially one of the most important life events, a unique and memorable uh, experience that you really want to get right. So you make those guys part of it and uh, contribute to this event who have been in the same situation like you and really know what your issues are when planning it and help you make your event a unique one so i think caviar and chips they are really able to tell a great brand story and this um, has made them so successful in such a short time Yes, it certainly does sound like a good business. And COVID-19, of course, has effectively stopped Caviar and Chips' operations for now. Um, there's no weddings, there's no corporate events, and even their new pub has temporarily closed. But from what Mark says, the consumer remains central to their business. Uh, he said, as you heard, uh, we've got a great product, a great service, and if we look after our clients, they'll look after us in the long term. Is it really that simple during this period to keep things going? Yeah, um, I think yes, it is. And also no, to be honest with you, Steve. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, it is quite simple from the pers from their perspective of their core offering. So I'm talking about the catering service for weddings. Because, um, yeah, what we know from research on how consumers cope during crisis situations is that they tend to create moments of hope and little moments of happiness in terms of uh, imagining or daydreaming potentially about a future that is brighter than the current one, potentially more cheerful than the current situation. And planning a wedding and uh, the corresponding food menu, I suppose, now during these rather unpleasant and um, restrictive times, definitely contributes to these moments of happiness. So that might be a reason why they still get a lot of bookings as well, something that Mark um, has stressed too in, in your interview. But apart from that, I think um, it is really not that simple because looking after your clients now also means a lot of work. So you have to engage with your customers, for example, on social media in order to not portray an image of being entirely paralyzed, I suppose. So you have to keep your customers up to date on forthcoming events. And I think also letting your consumers and customers know how other stakeholders in the business, such as suppliers, partners, employees, are supported by you as a business throughout the crisis and how they support each other to survive. I think this collaboration aspect is, again, quite important here. Yes, I mean, indeed, Mark's mantra of collaboration seems to run through his entire business. Uh, they say they're always working together with clients, partners, venues and suppliers. It sounds like there's no huge rows or legal battles over issues like terms and conditions 
during COVID-19. I mean, by acting in that way, by working together, has caviar and chips struck on a, on a magical ingredient for survival? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, well, what they got quite right here is really considering the solidarity aspect, which is quite important these days in a B2B context um, for businesses to survive. So trying to support each other. But more importantly, I think where applicable, um, the consumer is also really keen on chipping in as well. So I'm thinking about this very recent example of a microbrewery they produce craft beers and they came up with a special COVID-19 edition where they sell a six pack of their beer for 15 or 20 quid. So quite pricey, but the consumers, they are willing to pay that price because 10 pounds goes to um, partners in their network, so to restaurants and pubs, so supporting your local by doing something good and paying potentially a higher price here. So thinking long-term solidarity, um, the consumer being involved in the whole thing, that is quite important. And this solidarity, or uh, what I've referred in my, my own research to as consumer generativity, as I call it, that is um, becoming more attentive to giving back and helping others in need. That is really an important outcome of such a crisis situation from a consumer perspective. Yes, I was quite interested in your own research, actually, Julius. Um, just to uh, let our um, listeners in on that, it's based. your research is based on consumers going through crisis events, such as job losses, divorces and illnesses. And I, and I guess COVID-19 is, is another such crisis. And, and your research looks into how they cope and how they act after overcoming their crises. With that in mind, um, do businesses need to take care of consumers changing behaviour during the COVID-19 crisis? Yeah, I think um, it's really important that you um, yeah, uh, kind of ask that because one core consumer segment that I've identified in my own research is that of the so-called redemptive consumer. That's how we call this consumer segment. So those are the ones who kind of enduringly change their consumer attitudes and behaviors due to a particular crisis. And um, yeah, those people have become more thoughtful about what they consume, how much they need to consume due to often being forced to live uh, with less during a particular crisis. And um, interestingly, they maintain this lifestyle even after overcoming their personal crisis due to adopting a personal story or what we call a narrative of growth and enlightenment and um, simply put coming out of a negative life event as a better person, which is often reflected in a more mindful and kind of simplify your life attitude towards consumption. And I think businesses, they definitely need to take this redemptive consumer, this changing consumer into account during and after COVID-19 ends. Because we can see right now, considering the current pandemic, that consumers already start to re-examine what they consume and also how much they consume. So, for example, they place more value on non-material aspects of consumption, such as community, family, friends, overall health. I think I support, uh, that's, that's a common aspect and very important aspect and i think this is a great opportunity to tap into for businesses um, also specializing in, in food and hospitality for example no that's really good there's, there's some really rich stuff there julius and and for other businesses out there uh, with consumers where delivery of their products and services have paused stopped or dramatically changed because of COVID-19, uh, what are your top tips for them preparing for whatever becomes near normality in the near future? How can they make sure their consumers return to them? Yeah, I think that's the most pressing question, I suppose. And um, I guess it builds upon what I've said. So definitely to take care of your customers now during the crisis. Also what Mark from, from Caviar and Chips um, has called looking after your customers. So for example, in the food industry, I see so many creative solutions to making your customers happy in their homes during social isolation and doing things together with, with friends and family over social media. For example, one uh, German food caterer, I'm from Germany originally, and my hometown, Hamburg, this food caterer sells different recipes 
including the ingredients that their customers, consumers can order on, the, on their website and then collect from their store. And they can then prepare these dishes at home during a live Zoom cooking session. And this uh, cooking session is delivered by the food caterer. And uh, friends can join this event as well. So it kind of ties into what I've just said, this importance on community, friends, and uh, social media helps a lot in this regard, consumer engagement. But apart from showing this adaptability and creativity as a business now, I think, I think firms um, should equally adopt kind of a similar narrative of change, um, change towards the better, this redemptive narrative, after um, having reached some degree of normality again. So um, to give you an example, would be nice to learn something about what as a business they have learned from the crisis and how they have improved as a business. So, for example, consumers will value more businesses that do something for the common good, for example, by demonstrating how they treat partners and suppliers in a fair way and potentially also how they've made it together through the crisis, quite important. And also there's a need for the provision of nutrition that contributes to, to our health and follows higher standards in terms of hygiene. So we've become much more aware due to this crisis of um, the fragility of our own health. So businesses who take these changes into consideration in regards to the design of their service um, the promotion as well, they will certainly have an advantage of the pandemic after the pandemic in terms of return of their customers and also creating further loyalty. So I think Caviar and Chips, they're doing a lot of this already. And since they are great brand storytellers, what I've said in the beginning, they um, should include their personal story of mastering this crisis in their communication to customers as well. That's really useful stuff. Uh, Dr. Julia Stefan, a lecturer in marketing at Aston Business School. Many thanks for joining us on this episode and best wishes to you and your family at this time. Many thanks, Steve, and you. Thanks for having me. Yes, thanks both to Julius there and earlier to Mark Hornby of Caviar and Chips. What they both had to say about keeping close to your customers, partners, venues and suppliers during the current crisis will hopefully be something other SMEs will find helpful. We'll be back in the next few days with more case studies of how businesses are coping and with more crucial analysis and advice from academics and experts here at Aston. Aston means business. SMEs dealing with COVID-19. Thanks for listening.